This is The Civil Fleet, the podcast focused on the activist-led refugee rescue and support missions across Fortress Europe, with me, Ben Coles. In today's episode, we speak with Sophie and Patrick, journalists and activists with the anti-capitalist research cooperative, Corporate Watch. Sophie and Patrick are going to tell us about the private companies which are profiting from the UK and Europe's deportation regime. Specifically, we're going to talk about Air Partner and Carlson Wagonlit, which are two companies that organise chartered deportation flights across the continent. Okay, so before we get into today's episode, I've got the usual things, I'd like to remind you that the Civil Fleet is not just a podcast, it's also a website with news reports, investigative stories, interviews and more. So go to civilfleet.com to find out more about that stuff. Also, the Civil Fleet is entirely self-funded. Um, I don't plan on selling out anytime soon and cramming this full of adverts. Um, and, you know, I could afford it. But if you would like to help us cover the costs of running this thing, if you'd like to help us cover the costs of platforming the refugees, activists, lawyers, filmmakers and journalists and such that we have had on this podcast, then you can consider supporting us with a small donation or an absolutely massive donation if you like. You can go to co-fi.com slash civil fleet to do that. That's ko-fi.com slash civil fleet. Any donations that you send us will be greatly appreciated. Right, I think that's everything I've got to say. Let's get on with the show. So Sophie and Patrick, thanks very much for coming on the Civil Fleet Podcast. Thank you for having us. Yeah, thank you. Pleasure to be here. You're both from Corporate Watch, and we'll talk a little bit about that. And we're also going to talk about um, some work you've done that's actually been published on the Civil Fleet as well, about uh, deportation and private airlines that are involved. Uh, mainly, I think, Air Partner and an organisation called Carlson Wagon Lit. But we'll talk about those in a minute. Um, at the beginning of each episode, I'd like to ask the people on the podcast to tell us a bit about themselves so that re- the people listening can you know, understand who you are and also understand that they too can get involved in this kind of thing. Um, so maybe, Sophie, let's we'll start with you. Could you tell us yeah, a little about your background and how you ended up or, or, or what you do with Corporate Watch, that kind of thing? Okay, yeah, so I've been involved in grassroots activism for about 15 years, environmental stuff, but also um, largely migrant solidarity stuff at borders and in the UK. Um, So really focusing on sort of uh, direct action and direct solidarity with people through, through a sort of lens of solidarity rather than charity. And so I started working at Corporate Watch a few years ago and um, much of the work that I do here is around migration but we all do share different topics so also do environmental stuff and looking at kind of uh, landlords and prison companies or mental health companies and basically the whole range of of, of, uh, companies that we investigate at Corporate Watch. Um, Yeah so I think that's me. How about yourself, Patrick? Could you tell us a little bit about you? Yeah, um, I've also, like Sophie, been involved in, I guess, grassroots organizing and migrant solidarity uh, for a few years now. And um, I would describe myself mainly as a researcher. And I think my research into deportation charter flights kind of came out of um, involvements in Calais, um, and then when the, in 2022, uh, sorry, 2020, when um, there was the drive to deport uh, so-called channel crossers um, on Dublin deportation charter flights, uh, I started to get more interested in uh, what that was looking like and who was being removed and where to. And um, we started a group of people trying to organize also support um, for people in European countries after they had been removed, uh, who had maybe been through Calais and then been in the UK and then were back in uh, Germany or France or other European countries and then you know through grassroots networks try to get them support um, so that's how I came into researching this topic. Yeah that's both really interesting backgrounds and that kind of can see how you ended up doing this kind of thing with Corporate Watch. Um, could you tell us like Corporate Watch is something that I've really admired for quite a long time I think I first discovered 
corporate watch when I was doing my MA degree in 2014 in journalism I uh, came across what some of your stuff and I was like this is amazing um, and ever since I've always wanted to um, I've wanted to get in touch with you guys I think for a long time I had like I had a pinned email about something from you guys like, I think it was a while ago you were looking for writers I had it pinned on my thing for ages but I never got round to like applying for it or anything and then it, you know I ended up getting this job and blah 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 but that was a long time ago I had it pinned so I've always wanted to get you yeah, make a connection with you guys so it's really nice that you've um, written for me and uh, you know I've written for me you've allowed me to post your stuff on the civil fleet so thanks for that thanks for doing this podcast so Maybe uh, maybe you can tell us a bit about about corporate watch and the kind of work it does. Um, we're going to talk about one of the stories that you've you've written. Uh, but yeah, could you just you know for the uninitiated people listening who might not know, uh, could you tell us about about corporate watch? Yeah, sure. So corporate watch uh, was founded in 1996. Um, it kind of came out of the grassroots environmental movement in the UK, uh, especially the anti roads movement. We're a workers' corp a very small workers co-op that investigates companies um, to support groups organizing um, against corporate power. So that could be um, groups of tenants organizing against their landlords or people trying to um, resist uh, some kind of uh, like a destructive development or it could be people campaigning against like a vivisection lab. So yeah, so the, the, the core of what we do is research. Um, we also do trainings. We deliver trainings on how to investigate companies to campaign groups. And the research that we do is done um, either at the request of campaign groups or uh, alongside those groups. So we, we appreciate that uh, the, those that are like up against corporate power don't necessarily have the time to do hours of laborious research into uh, the companies that they're fighting um, so we kind of take that on and we're very much focused on what we call information for action so that's finding doing like strategic research to find information that could be used as leverage in campaigns so looking at weak spots in in co- companies and 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 things that could be used effectively by the campaigns um, to to win, um, so we're we're still like ever since like nineteen ninety six we're we've been really rooted in grassroots social movements in the UK. Um, we try to sort of you know we, we we ourselves continue to be active in 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 organizing campaigns for social justice and, and ecological justice. So we we try to stay connected to those uh, to those groups and. And really go with what's like what people need. Um, so we we take requests from 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 uh, from organisations from from groups, and we um, yeah like I said we carry out research alongside them. At the same time, those the training that we do is to try and arm people with the tools to carry out the research themselves. Because like we also don't want to set ourselves up as like experts who you can just call on to to. <laughs> to to, to, to do that kind of thing like we, we, we like these kind of this knowledge to be shared as widely as possible most of the tools that we use are like freely available and so yeah it's just really a question of knowing where to look so I think that's us in a nutshell I should say that like what you see on our website which is uh, corporatewatch.org is not the whole picture of what we do so some of our research goes unpublished like if we're kind of commissioned to do some like specific a specific investigation like sometimes campaign groups like just ask for that to be done privately a long time ago i had a book that you'd published maybe it was like 2014 15 time and it was like how to investigate companies and i used it loads um i've tried to use it in the past and it's been really it's been really helpful um so yeah i think the work that corporate watch has done is really really invaluable um and if anyone listening doesn't know who they are i should definitely check you out thank you yeah so actually on that we've got um the investigating companies book uh freely to uh, freely available on our website to download um we've got an online course as well which is again is free um and you can usually find us at um sort of grassroots events around the country like radical book fairs and and things like Earth, the Earth first summer gathering um where we're we can be found delivering workshops 
I think you also have a podcast now as well, right? I was just flicking through the website the other day and was heard, uh, it was it was focused on sort of on like the environment, right? And companies involved in that is is that right? Uh, yeah, actually, yeah. So we did a series of recordings at the last year's uh, first summer gathering, and um, the focus there was to kind of spotlight campaigns um, that have been interesting environmental campaigns um, and looking at how they're approaching um, their fight against corporate power. Um, so we we we're really keen to you know we don't want to just be journalists like reporting on on miserable stuff that's going on around the world. We want to uh, inspire people to action by sharing information about um, effective uh, campaigns. Um, so we don't want to just depress people. We want to show look look what you can do and look people are doing it um, and you can get involved or you can do something similar yourself. Um, yeah. We, we don't want to disempower, um, but inspire people to action. That's a really good point, because I think a lot of journalism, and a lot, I know sometimes the work I've done is just focused on absolutely depressing stuff, and it leaves you feeling like there's nothing you could absolutely, there's nothing you can do and everyone's fucked. But um, I like that, you know, trying to reach out to people, trying to let people know that they can make a change. I think that's important, definitely an important part of journalism. Yeah, for sure, for sure. And like, we're, we're not, you know, while we maintain like rigorous standards of um, verification and sourcing and all of that, we, we ensure that like, all of that is done, um, done w- well, we're not making any, uh, you know, we don't have pretensions of like impartiality, we definitely have an agenda. And that is uh, to support grassroots campaigns against corporations who are like, you know, ex- exploiting people on the planet every single day. Yeah, that's. I think it's quite with a name like Corporate Watch. It's quite obvious uh, that you've got an agenda, right? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so um, I don't know, Patrick. Was there anything else you wanted to add there, or shall, or shall we move on to the to the next sort of set of questions I've got? Um, yeah, uh, let's move on to the questions. All right. So we're gonna talk. We're gonna move. The main reason I've got you both on is to talk about um, Air Partner and the private companies that are involved in deportation deportations in Britain. Um, but maybe we could start by kind of just setting the scene of of the like the, how the deportation regime works in Britain. Um, I know we've had a lot of people on this podcast talking about this, this what it's like being here, but we're not really talked about how people get deported and what it's like. I don't know, maybe you could give us kind of set the scene of of how this works in the UK. Yeah, Patrick, do you want to go on this one? So, I mean, first of all, I um, have never experienced uh, deportation, so I can't really speak to what it's like. Um, But in general, deportations are used by the government to uh, enforce immigration policy. Um, And in the UK, we can see that they are specifically targeted against different communities at different times. Um, What I mentioned in the beginning, the kind of stop the boats, initiative, if you want to call it that, from the government has kind of led to a change um, in who is being focused, uh, who is being targeted for charter flight deportations, which is what we've mainly been researching. Um, but this has now shifted towards Albanians who uh, who are now the kind of new uh, scapegoats in the media, um, not only for crossing the channel, but also for presumed criminality and preservation of organized crime, uh, trafficking, all these kind of things. So, um, I can't, again, speak to how deportations, what what they're like, but um, I should say that the UK deports a minority of people on chartered flights. Most are individual people removed on scheduled flights. Um, In 2022, I believe only 40% of people were um, placed on charter flights, deported on charter flights, whereas in 2021 it was 46.9. And and that was much more than in 2020. It seems only 26 of uh, enforced removals were by charter flight. And in uh, 2019, when many charter flights were stopped due to COVID, um, only 6% of enforced removals from the UK were on charter flights. So for the most part, um, these are people being yeah arrested in the communities at work um during immigration enforcement raids uh and then detained and then uh being transferred to one of the immigration removal centers uh and then either forced onto a scheduled flight or in some cases in a minority of cases there are these special charter flights arranged to 
uh, expel a large number of people en masse to a particular country. And charged by by charter flight, you mean it's like it's uh, been chartered. It's a private company that's been chartered by the Home Office, right? To has been contracted by the Home Office to remove people. Is is that is that what you mean, right? Yeah. I, I, unfortunately, again, you've broken up in the question. Uh, I believe you asked um, what a charter flight is. Yes. It like it. How is it different to like a standard flight? Uh, it's different in that um, a home the Home Office basically leases an entire plane to fly one route for it. Um, and that plane is there for the purpose of deporting people. There are no, uh, well, there's many other people on the plane, but these are um, guards uh, now employed by Mighty who are there um, to keep people in their seats. There are some home office uh, functionaries, representatives. Uh, there are some paramedics, but for the most part, the entire plane is only flying for the purpose of deporting people to a particular country. Mm. And yeah, so the the other thing is like just prior like prior to the deportation, usually it's, it's common for people to be moved around detention centers, which disrupts their ability to access legal advice. Um, and people's phones are removed from them before uh, the deportation to basically minimize the chance of them being able to either report on what's going on or, um, you know, contact their lawyers and, and, and try and stop it. So um, there's a high degree of, of, of control, obviously, um, before before the deportation. The other thing is that there's usually at least two, quote, escorts, as Patrick mentioned, like, per person on uh, on a flight run by Mighty. So, you know, there's, there's, there's a high, high degree of control. And the whole rationale behind charter flights is to minimize the chance of, of resistance. And, and obviously also to, to deport as many people as possible in one go. So, yeah, the, the, they were introduced in the UK in, I think, 2001 by the New Labour, New Labour government. And um, and yeah, ironically, actually, given how things are going today, like the the, the first flight, I believe, was to was also to Albania. Yeah. So when people are deported on like scheduled flights, like say commercial commercial flights, it can be easier to resist those because people can passengers can sometimes step in and um, you know you can also witness the the violence perpetrated by the guards. On the other hand, um, charter flights keep that away from public view. So everything that happens on there is, is you know, it's a secret. Um, it's very, very hard to gather evidence of actually what goes on on those flights. All, all we have as non-deportees is um, testimonies from people who have been deported um, in sort of, you know, some instances where um, people have been met on the other end. Um, and and asked about how that's gone. So, sorry, I, I should say on that that um, there has been great research from uh, Liberty Investigates into uh, uses of force on charter flights. Um, around the Rwanda case, uh, they uh, they got documents about the use of force on those flights. The the I mean the pain positions, the compliance positions that guards were using, and the um, things that they were trying to do. On that flight, um, uh, which should be read as well as um, the uh, inspector of prisons um, sometimes uh, releases reports on specific charter flights where they go into the use of force, which takes place. Sorry. Yeah, I, I think um, I've seen the Liberty stuff. I'll, I'll link that into the show notes uh, so people listening can find those. And I'm pretty sure that I think the independent newspaper, it might have been The Guardian, can't remember which, but they have also had reports on. There was one that was quite, um, there was quite a famous case. I think it was either last year or the year before, when um, a flight to Rwanda was about to take off and activists managed to stop it. Um, and I think there was reports um, on either of those two newspapers on, on from people uh, who was on that flight. Um, but yeah, I was going to say this. There's there's been um, quite a lot of. Um, resistance to these deportations even like amongst communities right there was a really famous one in Glasgow either last year or the year before again when hundreds of people just crowded around a van, police van to stop these people being deported and also in Lewisham I think it was Lewisham or near uh, Peckham I'm not sure about that they, these things are amazing to see uh, so there's been quite a lot of resistance right yeah absolutely and and so there's there's been resistance in, in various forms like from deportees themselves um, uh, which can be 
uh, effective, uh, particularly in the case of like scheduled flights, um, but also um, from uh, like like activists in solidarity with with migrants. So like um, whether that's like literally blocking the coaches that are trying to uh, take people from the detention centers to the planes. Um, that's been going on for years on and off, uh, like lock-ons to, to, to block the path. Um, or um, one strategy that can be very effective is resistance in the community to immigration raids. And the reason for that is because it's, you know, it's out in public, it's in the middle of the street, there's lots of people, um, whereas like trying to resist at a detention center or an airport is obviously a lot harder because it's a, a highly controlled zone. So, um, yeah, there have been many, many instances of people uh, blocking immigration vans, of, of standing in the way, of, you know, shouting, of, of um, and, and like effectively preventing people from getting into the clutches of immigration enforcement and then into detention centres and, and then bundled off on planes uh, to, back to countries of origin. Yeah, and it's always really, it's always really great to see those um the, the people resisting it. I've been trying to get them on the podcast, actually, uh, but I kind of need to wait for another one to happen. Um, so let's move on to um, which companies are involved, because like like you've been saying, I think, Patrick, you were saying this, these are private companies. Uh, Mighty is a private company that's involved in this. Um, so you, you've done some articles on Air Partner and a company called Carlson Wagonlit. I think that's how it's said. Um could you kind of give us, kind of tell us background about these companies and, and what they do and how they do it on behalf of the UK Home Office? Yeah, so to just kind of briefly map out some of the border profiteers, we've got um, Carlson Wagonlit, which is a, a travel company, international travel company that we've known about for years um, that has uh, been doing what they call like the ticketing services, which is literally like booking the tickets for um, deportation flights, um, sort of overseeing the overall logistics of the op, um, uh, liaising with guards and all of that. Um, and so we've known about them for a really long time, but what we didn't realize is that a chunk of that work was being outsourced to um, a company called Air Partner, which we'll talk about in a minute. Um, so the reason for that is because the, the, the UK... Um, website contracts finder which provide pr sort of releases information on um like public procurement so like contracts um won by companies for government work um actually had a lot of stuff redacted and when we looked at the european equivalent um which is called uh ted um tenders electronic daily um we found that there was a bit that wasn't redacted in that that mentioned that um, a whole bunch of the work had been subcontracted to Air Partner. Um, so, and the work that's subcontracted to Air Partner is um, effectively finding the airlines to do the deportations. So, um, it's, a, it's totally a middleman job. Um, they liaise with airlines like, uh, well, the deportation airlines, we've kind of done quite a lot of reporting on in Corporate Watch, which are. Um, uh, so, you know, Privileged Star, we've mentioned, Titan Airways, um, Air Tanker, TUI. Um, uh, Patrick, can you remember some more? There's a few. Yeah, sure. So um, currently this year, because they also change from year to year uh, based on public pressure campaigns. Um, so TUI is pulled out. Um, High Fly, which was doing many in 2020 has uh, seemingly stopped or at least they've reduced the number of flights that they fly but um this year so far uh, in the first quarter of 2023 um there's titan which is a british company flying out of stansted corindon which is a turkish um tourist airline privileged style which uh, there's been a lot of reporting on especially after their involvement in the uh, failed rwanda flight uh, then you have a portuguese company another small portuguese airline euro atlantic and another Spanish small charter airline called Albastar. So um, what it's, it's quite interesting to see is that many of these companies are headquartered in Spain and Portugal, um, and they're you know they're they're flying not only flights for the UK Home Office but for other European governments uh, these deportation charter flights. So it's it's a lot of the same companies that you see popping up again and again, not only in the UK but uh, throughout Europe. 
Yeah, absolutely. And besides, you know, besides that, we've also got, um, you know, a whole string of profiteers along the way. We've got the guards that we've mentioned a few times. So Mighty um, has had the contract. Uh, I can't remember since when um, to, 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 to basically do this so-called escorting service. So to provide, to provide guards for deportations and to move detainees around the country between detention centers. Uh, Mighty also runs uh, Dungable Detention Center, um, what's now known as Heathrow Detention Center, which is made up of Colnbrook and Harmonsworth. Um, so those two sites are now apparently turned into one like mega detention center with like up to a capacity of up to a thousand people, more or less. Um, they were uh, running operations, security operations at Manston Camp, uh, Derwent side detention center. So and so Mighty currently run approximately 50% of the UK's uh, immigration detention capacity. And then alongside them, we've got Serco, which runs um, the Gatwick Detention Centre, which was formerly known as like Brook House and Tinsley House. Again, they've kind of been merged into one operation with one big beneficiary. Um, and they're running that until 2028, um, at least, because a lot of these contracts can be extended for a couple more years, usually. And they also run Yarlswood uh, Detention Centre, as well as asylum housing. Um, so yeah, that's that's kind of just some of the biggest um, beneficiaries of of the border regime. Um, it's crazy. It's like a you know we just listed loads of companies there, and it's just like an enormous industry, right? Of of, of cruelty, basically, um, and all this money. It's just mad. Like the money that goes into all of this could just solve so many of the problems in a completely different, much more humane way. It's just mind boggling to me. <laughs> Yeah, t- totally. Just on that, um, you see that there is really huge costs involved. Um, so in 2022, I believe the Home Office spent $12,145,000 um, on 62 flights, uh, with five being cancelled. Uh, and that's not even the money that they spend on guards, um, the, the mighty guards. No, that's just for the plane. Um, and so that's about a £180,000 average for the flights. Uh, and and that's been that's been pretty consistent, um, I believe. Yeah, yeah, and you know, the, uh, you talked about the cruelty. Um, it is obviously absolutely despicable. But um, when you know the, they can continue to do all this so long as like most of that cruelty is hidden behind locked doors um, or hidden on uh, charter flights, for example. Um, when it gets too much in the public eye, then that's when, you know, there might have some consequences. So, for example, G4S used to uh, have a lot of contracts, like they used to be, um, they used to run Brookhouse, um, they they ran, they, they were also like doing what Mighty did before, so they were doing like, uh, the, um, uh, the guard, the escorting contract. But then, you know, with, with G4S, um, the whole story with Jimmy Mabenga happened. Yeah. You know, also, there was undercover reporting in Brook House, um, which revealed like a huge amount of violence being perpetrated by G4S against detainees, um, and that was that was aired on Panorama. It was makes really really difficult viewing and listening. Um, but you know, there's a kind of threshold for when it when it gets into public view that you know the government decides actually this is this is just a little too hot and we need to get rid of them and then it just goes out to another um profiteer basically yeah it's like you know they kick up a they, the media on the government will kick up a fuss about numbers of people coming in and there's so much attention on that on how to how to stop it um but there's very very little attention on on what actually happens inside the system right and like you said when it does uh, when there is attention like G4S and privilege style, particularly with the Robanda flights. And I think you mentioned TUI, TUI pulled out of this kind of stuff. They, when there is criticism of, of it, they, the companies tend to like pull out, That I, I think, at least from, from those examples. It, it it really depends. So like at Corporate Watch, we really focus on, on what, um, you know, trying to, find re- trying to find research findings that could materially help a campaign. So provide some kind of leverage or like, 
focus a little on the weak spots um, in, in, in that company. So in the case of Highfly, which seems to step back, they were doing a whole bunch of high profile um, gestures um, to support refugees. So like, you know, refugee evacuation type flights or um, they had a foundation that was doing, uh, you know, schemes to apparently support refugees. So it wasn't a good look, you know, to be, to be, you know, to, to, to have the kind of truth revealed um, on them and to show that they were actually making a significant amount of money from um, deport, deporting refugees. And in the case of TUI, uh, TUI was a massive company. Um, it was a huge multinational. Deportations is kind of a really, really marginal um, sort of source of revenue. You know, they're, they're, they're a package holiday company. And so they care a lot about their reputation. To be associated with deportations is potentially, you know, uh, too, too risky. And but what it takes is, you know, it's rare that you can kind of win, win over a company with a few tweets. Um, what it took in the case of TUI was some sustained campaigning. It was groups coming around, you know, coming together from around the country, organizing national days of action, picketing outside their travel agents and just sustaining that pressure until the company capitulated. And, you know, as far as I'm aware, the, it hasn't actually released anything to say we're not doing this. And it's very rare that you can actually get a company to do that. But you know, it's clear from, um, you know, flight monitoring, um, the flight tracking that we're doing, that, that TUI hasn't been involved in deportations from the UK um, on charter flights uh, since since then and so um air partner which is this this is the company that we've been talking about and they kind of they organize the different airlines uh to get involved in the um uh, de- uh to deport people from the uk and elsewhere in europe um they're also involved in they they have a different business right they also move sports teams around they fly celebrities and politicians around europe as well right yeah, absolutely. I mean, they Air Partner started off in the '60s as a sort of uh, a company that was training up military pi- ex-military pilots for the commercial sector. Um, it's a company that's really rooted in 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 military work. Um, so uh, that's uh, basically transporting troops and um, cargo to 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 war zones. And that's what that was represented the bulk of its work for for a long time, and in more recent years it has diversified to do as you said, um, shuttling celebrities, organising group charters, sports teams, and and so on, um, and of course doing these deportations. Although it's clear that their work in deportations um, dates back to at least the very early 2000s um, and they, they work they work in numerous countries and are they still involved in military type stuff like it'd be, it's quite strange that they could they had they may have been involved in like war zones which creates people on the move refugees and migrants and then now they're also involved in sending them back it's it's pretty grim yeah yeah the, the, the evidence strongly suggests that they're still very much involved in that um, it's interesting though, to see their commentary I mean like it's it's hard to be shocked working at Corporate Watch because you see so much corporate crap uh, over the years. But um, uh, like to see, you know, the, the the way that the the company bosses basically talked about um, conflict and the money that was made from it is it's just so transparent. So for example, um, we have one quote here from uh, from the chairman. Um, back in, I think, 2007, where he said that the events of 9-11 were a watershed for the aviation industry. Since then, our sales have tripled and our profitability has quadrupled. Um, and there was another there was another quote where they effectively kind of lamented the, uh, the, the, the drop in, um, uh, well, it's... It, it, it's described euphemistically, but they talk about this, effectively the, the conflict in, in Iraq um, and, and the impact that had on, on, on sales. So it, 
I guess, you know, when your work is tied to an aggressive foreign policy, um, that that's potentially risky um, in, in the sense that you know, you, you, you're relying on that policy to be sustained and you might not be um, uh, kind of cushioned from the shocks of changes in, 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 foreign, in foreign policy. So that's why I would kind of assume that they've, they've chosen to diversify. And it's, it's, and it's, it's, to me, it's really, it feels really, you know, like a maze or like a really difficult maze. There's the companies that are contracted by different government departments around Europe, which then subcontract at work. It's so like, it's, it's quite hard to get your head around, I think, sometimes. Or maybe in this case, not so much. But in other, you know, when I've tried to look at, investigate other things, it's like, who is responsible for what's going on here? It's, it's really complicated. Yeah, yeah. And, you know, a lot of this information is, of course, kept as secret as it can be. Um, it takes some digging to, to piece these things together. Um, yeah, so like you, it, it is sometimes you wonder, you know, with so many middlemen, like what actually are they doing to get so much money? Um, in the case of Air Partner, I think that an important thing to point out is that since their role is effectively to um, to to procure the airlines to get to get airlines to to do specific deportations when governments ask uh, for them to happen. They are there in the background when campaigners are, you know, fighting against privileged style, TUI and so on. So you might be effective in getting, like, let's say, TUI to, to drop deportations, but you've got air partner in the background trying to source someone else. Um, so I think it's kind of, it's really important to remember that they're there. Um, and um while they're still doing that job they will still they will find other companies to do it mm. and um what's the role of, you've mentioned them a bit um in this podcast carlson wagon what's what's their role in um in this could you kind of describe a little bit more of what what that company does yeah well i mean they 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 just do it's described as ticketing services so they they have overall responsibility for um the logistics around the deportations charter deportations um and actually uh sorry um also uh commercial so individual deportations on commercial flights um so they they will liaise with the guards they will they have a, a system called i think it, uh do i have the name here i think it's called early removal service or something like that um where they basically buy the tickets they book the tickets for the for the airlines from the airlines and air partner is the one that's involved in getting and all the all the planes uh, to get the planes on the tarmac. I suppose, yeah. Exactly. I mean, they they need an actual airline. They need crew to do it, and it's it's air partner that does that. So um, they so besides their work for the UK Home Office, air partner works with they have they have contracts with a number of individual governments. So the government of Austria, Germany, Ireland, um, and the US. Um, not all right now, but over the you know, in the past uh, couple of decades, they've had contracts with these governments. Um, as well as those, they've also currently got the contract with the U the European um, border agency Frontex, um, along with three other companies um, to to organise logistics for deportations. And the work there is very similar to the work it does in the UK. Um, it also kind of gets like landing permits it get it books hotels if there's delays like presumably for the for the guards um and yeah so that's it it, it does a lot of, of work in a lot of countries it's turned out to be quite a significant um company in the in the sort of uh among the border profiteers yeah i mean it's such a it's such a deep topic and there's so much we could go into here uh i think in the interest of time maybe we should move to a kind of a broader sort of thing but was there anything else you know we should talk about air 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 partner or, or the deep the companies involved in deportations i want to ask a kind of broader question uh as we get towards the end of our time here but was there anything else you wanted to add about the about the company or something i should have asked i mean no, i would say 
I don't have anything to add other than to point out that um, while while we continue to focus just on the airlines um, like Privilege Style and and Tui, we you know behind the scenes there is this company, uh, well two companies, um, Air Partner and Carlson Wagon Lit, um, who have been for you know, years and years benefiting from um, the misery of people um, being deported. So, yeah, it's just to kind of highlight that they're there um, and we're, we're, it's quite easy to get to, to focus on the airlines, especially when they've got ridiculous names like Privilege Style, um, you know, uh, or, or they're like um, a, a familiar brand like Tui. You know, there's, there's also these kind of more in some ways more boring companies behind the scene who who are um, equally if not more um, yeah uh, worth uh, worthy of attention yeah that's a good I'm glad to point that out so and I think that I would add um, the importance of having a kind of transnational uh, coalition to attack this the system right because the airlines are often not headquartered in the UK it's kind of only Titan and before air tanker that was actually a UK company um, these are companies based overseas, as well as UK companies that are doing this work uh, for other governments uh, doing the same thing, right? So the international deportation machine is very internationally organized amongst um, EU member states in the UK. Mm. So I think our resistance has to be joined up too to, to combat it effectively. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, that, that's why I hope the podcast does it in a little small way. Is I tried to focus on Europe as a whole, um, although the last few episodes have been UK focused. Um, but yeah, that's, that's absolutely true. And I, I think you're right as well, Sophie, when you said that we need to focus on these companies. Uh, I think it's uh, on those middlemen companies, Air Partner and Carlson Wagon, because uh, it is, as particularly as journalists, I think it's easier to focus on the big companies that everyone knows, like TUI and Privileged Star and this kind of thing. Um, how do you, this is, a, this is a question I like to ask people towards the end of the podcast, is, um, you know, the, the situation now and the future, how do you, how do you see, how do you see things going? Because I, I often think it's like, we're just hurtling towards a horrible dystopian nightmare. But I think that's not a very, um, <laughs> not a good way to look at the world. And I think it's better to have some sort of hope, you know, I think if you act like there's hope, then you then maybe then you could change things. Um, so yeah, this is my one of my last questions is how do you feel about the future and, and where we're going and what can we do to change it? I, well, maybe I, I can take the first half and uh, Sophie, you can take the second. Um, and then specifically just looking at deportation charter flights. I think the interesting thing is to watch how the people uh, and the countries have changed that, that they've been targeting over the years. So in the beginning, or I should say maybe 10 years ago, around 2010, um, 2010 to 2015, most charter flights were to Afghanistan. Um, Albania has always been at the top of the list, but also Pakistan. Uh, there were some to Iraq, um, many to Nigeria, Ghana, um, Jamaica, things like this. And these, uh, well, I should say in recent years, especially, so there was a brief period of um, the deportation of asylum seekers to other European countries, the kind of uh, accelerated deportation right before the run-up to Brexit, when people would no longer then be able to be removed under the Dublin agreements. Uh, but then since that time, in the last couple of years, it's really been Albania um, and then other European countries uh, to which European people are being deported with every now and then Jamaica, um, Zimbabwe, uh, Vietnam, um, you know other other destinations and the what what we've seen now this year is that everyone has you know there's been 14 flights so far in the first quarter most 12 to albania and then two to romania and everyone is um being taken from prison and they're either on uh early release schemes or they're taking voluntary return after serving a prison sentence and i think what this highlights is how the criminalization of migration and then um, kind of creating de facto migrant criminals to then deport later um, is picking up. And with the new, well, so already the Nationality and Borders Act, but with this new illegal uh, migration bill, you'll see that the further, you know, by criminalizing people for crossing the border into this country, um, they will already be not only better political candidates uh, as foreign criminals, but um, the, the ways that they're being criminalized will have knock-on effects potentially for their asylum claims and for their ability to settle in the country. Um, 
And then if we do see flights to Rwanda or any third country, which the UK could make an agreement with, right? Because it's not only Rwanda, they're, they're pursuing other agreements to, other deport, uh, to deport people to other countries. I can expect that we will see the use of charter flights for this, because if nothing else, a charter flight is a big, spectacular event, uh, which they can put on the, head, the, the front page of a newspaper. And in fact, from my perspective, these flights um, are more about creating a spectacle of the government doing immigration enforcement than they are about effectively removing a large number of people. So um, they're trying to make it easy for themselves doing flights to Romania and Albania. Um, but I think, I think that, um, yeah, we have to continue to be vigilant about all the other people being deported one by one to other places. Uh, and of course, resist the charter flights when we can. Um, so yeah, but, but yeah, I think criminalization of migration and trying to resist that in the upcoming bill, this is extremely important. And I, like you said, this it's like a spectacle. I've often thought that, like, you, if you look at the UK Home Office's Twitter account, it's can't like recently it's keep saying we've deported fifty two people today, or like we've sent home so many like whatever twelve foreign criminals. Um, it's just like exactly, weird. and 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 this is off of you know the, they signed this new agreement um, with Albania with the government of Albania, right? And since then, they've only deported to Albania because it it allows them to get those high numbers, which they can then tweet about, and they can be seen to be doing something. Whereas what, what they don't like is they don't like organizing a flight to Jamaica and then having uh, 30 people get taken off um, due to the human rights claims that they make. And then in the end, they fly with four people. That, that makes them look ridiculous. So I think with these charter flights, they're pursuing quite easy targets. Uh, people from prison, you know, who are agreeing in some ways to their own deportation not all of them but uh they they rather fill the planes with these you know easy easy targets to get the high numbers which they can then tweet about and you had re recently you know the immigration minister who was um talking about we're going to find the albanians we're going to you know get them to tirana this really persecutory language right because it's it's all a propaganda activity in my it's, it's not only that right we're talking about people's lives but um yeah we shouldn't yeah, we have to keep that in mind, how they how they game the numbers uh, with these flights. I think, Sophie, you were going to take the second half of this horrible question. Oh, um, well, I can't remember what the second part was, but it was it was about the future, right? And um, and is there any hope? Is there something along those lines? Yeah, that's right. Yeah. <laughs> well, uh, it's incredibly bleak. The future is bleak. Um, there's yeah, there's. Uh, just a constant torrent of bad news when it comes to migration, but um, we know we know that people can organise effective resistance um, through direct action. Like we've seen that in the forms of like anti raids activism, resisting a people from being snatched from their communities. We've seen that in the form of people blocking uh, charter flights, blocking the coaches, and. Yeah, at the minimum, like buying a bunch of people time to actually so that their lawyers can um, stay their deportations um, in the courts. So we we know that resistance can be effective uh, when people organise themselves and are willing to take risks to do so, um, and that gives me hope. Um, we just need more of it. Absolutely, I always think that seeing those kind of actions that you mentioned there is always. It always warms the heart when you see an anti-deportation rally and this kind of thing. Um, so yeah, I think it's up to us, right, to try and make the future better. Um, so the last question I wanted to ask was, um, I'm going to have links to Corporate Watch to people to find at work. I'm sure most people, many people listening to this will already know. Uh, but what are some ways that people can follow Corporate Watch, find out more about what you do, get involved and, um, and support you? Cool. Yeah, the best thing is probably to subscribe to our newsletter and there's a link uh, on our website to do that. And if you subscribe to the newsletter, you'll hear about um, uh, like events that we're going to, workshops we're doing, you'll hear about our recent reports and things like that. Um, you can also become a friend of Corporate Watch, which is um, like basically throwing us like two quid every month or whatever, um, which really helps to stay as grassroots as possible, like and provide like basically, you know, all our work for free to grassroots um, groups. 
Um, and yeah, we're on Twitter, we're on Facebook. Obviously, we're not big fans of those tools, um, but we also believe in like reaching people beyond, beyond the kind of like activist bubble, if you like. Um, so you can find us there. But like, yeah, probably our newsletter and our website, which is corporatewatch.org. Perfect. Um, Sophie and Patrick, that was really good. Um, I feel like I should have gone longer with this episode because I feel like there's so much more to talk about. But uh, hopefully we'll get you both back on. I mean, in a way, I hope not to get you back on because I just want the situation <laughs> to be over. But it's not going to be over in the short term, I think. Um, but uh, yeah, thank you so much for, for coming on. Um, it's been really nice to speak to you both. And um, I'll be in touch. Oh, thank you for your time, Ben. It's been a real pleasure. Thank you. Well, that was episode 40 of the Civil Fleet podcast. Thanks once again to Sophie and Patrick for coming on. Thanks to Corporate Watch for all the amazing things that they do and for checking me a couple of articles, getting me to publish stuff. Absolutely amazing stuff. Do check them out. I have links to everything that they talked about um, in the podcast, so go check them out. Definitely check out uh, Corporate Watch. Um, What else do I need to say? Oh, yes, if you like the podcast... You can give us a donation at co-fee.com slash civilfeet. Give us a bit of money. Give us a load of money. It's up to you. Or don't do anything. That's fine. And the other thing you can do for me, which would really, really help, is you can share it around. You can tell your friends and family about the podcast. You can write us a review. Give us a five-star rating and all that kind of crap. And that would be great. Right. I think that's everything I need to say. I've got another episode in the can, so we're going to have another one out pretty soon. Um, it's unlike me. Normally, it's recently, it's been taking me a long time to get episodes out, but this month I'm on it. Uh, right. Anyway, I'll see you soon. Cheers. <laughs>